Today I'm going to cover a concept that often comes off as rather abstract, but in fact is extremely concrete and of great importance, and that's the effective mass of charge carriers. Now to begin with, let me make it clear that an electron's mass is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, period. But the effective mass describes how mass of the electron appears to be in the crystalline environment as it passes through the crystal, depending on which direction it's going. Here's a silicon crystal. We'll call this blue plane down here the perpendicular direction. Any movement in the blue plane is perpendicular to the c-axis. And any movement perpendicular to the blue plane is parallel to it. And so we have essentially two directions. We'll call it the in-plane direction, which is labeled as M perpendicular, and the parallel direction labeled as M parallel. The star means effective mass. Because the electric field is a consequence of all of the ions that the electron goes by, how the electric field environment appears in those two directions depends on the location of ions, depends on the coordination of the crystal. That will cause the electron's acceleration to vary over space, leading to an average acceleration of the electron over space that gives it an effective apparent mass, and it is different in those two directions. So this varying acceleration, hence a varying effective force, is accounted for not by actually calculating a position-dependent acceleration or a position-dependent force, but rather just by having a mass that appears to be the mass of the electron. If the electron were just a free electron in the environment of the crystal, m star is the mass I would have. And if it's going in the blue plane, it's m perpendicular star. If it's going perpendicular to the blue plane, it's m parallel star, parallel to the axis. Any calculations that include mass actually use this effective mass, m star. For example, the conductivity, which is linear in the carrier density, and the carrier density, n, the number of electrons per unit volume goes as the mass of the three halves, so we use the reduced mass instead. This is going to get in front of us a lot coming up, especially in, during chapter two when we're dealing with transport properties. There the mass is involved in all sorts of calculations and we always have to use the effective mass. Effective mass has its origin in the dispersion relation of the electron. Energy of an electron is momentum squared over twice the mass. What we're looking at is the comparison between a free electron, which has this dispersion relation, h bar squared k squared over 2 mass, and an electron in a crystalline environment, which has a different dispersion relation. And if we're talking about an electron, we'll say m sub b, and we're just going to talk about an electron for now. Let's take the derivative of the energy relation. And we have what's actually more classically referred to as the dispersion relation, the rate of change of energy with wave number. Let's take the derivative again and make k go away. This expression can be rearranged to give you mass as a function of the curvature of energy with k. So that puts the curvature of the dispersion diagram in the denominator, and the mass of the electron is inversely proportional to that. Now you can check it by just taking the second derivative of electric field of K and putting it back in, and you simply have electron mass as electron mass. But if the electron is not free, we're going to continue to use this expression. And that's the idea of effective mass. Effective mass allows us to continue using expressions for a free particle, but by altering the mass, we can still get agreeable answers we'll replace the second derivative of energy with k with something else. Energy versus k is a parabola for a free particle. But for a particle in a crystalline environment, the dispersion relation changes. Do you remember the parabola? For a free particle, E versus k is just energy is, goes as k squared. But when it gets put into a crystalline environment, you have these deviations from the parabolic behavior with these very sharp changes in the curvature near the band edges, and then you have the band gaps. With the dispersion function of an electron bound in a crystal, we have a different second derivative of energy with k, but if we use that second derivative of energy with k that comes from the crystalline band structure, we can extend the equations of classical mechanics into the crystalline environment. So that's our expression then for effective mass. It's not the second derivative of energy with k for a free particle, but whatever it is for this particle confined to a periodic potential. That comes from the graph here. 
that's the effective mass. So it's the same expression, different number because a different second derivative in the denominator. It's basically h bar squared divided by the curvature of the dispersion relation. If you change anything about the crystal, its composition, its coordination, you change that second derivative and you'll change the effective mass. We're not going to have to run simulations of the second derivative of energy with K. What we will have available to us is a table of known effective masses. This description is really by way of the origin of the effective mass, but now we're going to start using numbers that are available in reference documents. You may just want to write down the expression in this red box. It's going to keep coming up. Now let's go back to the energy band diagram of a semiconductor. This is a direct gap semiconductor, but all of this discussion is equally applicable to direct and indirect gaps. So we have the conduction band up here, and then there's the band gap, E sub G, and then there are multiple valence bands, including this one that seems offset. They're all legitimate valence bands, the heavy hole, light hole, and spin split off band. Let me just mention a few things about these band edges. First, there's only one important conduction band. There are a lot of conduction bands, and hence a lot of conduction band edges, where the edge is defined as the bottom of a conduction band. But only the lowest conduction band matters, because if it were full of electrons, then we would be moved on to the next one. And there are not that many conduction electrons. They fall into the lowest conduction band first. So that's the one that we pay attention to. Second point is that when the electrons are moving around the crystal, they move in these different directions, and so they move anisotropically. If you look at the band diagram for a semiconductor, now this one happens to be silicon, it's an indirect gap semiconductor, but everything applies to both types. The electron's direction of motion is indicated by where it is in k-space, and these are different points in the reciprocal lattice that are called out in this diagram. The horizontal axis is the direction of motion because it's the direction of the wave vector, which is essentially which direction the electron wave is propagating. As each different direction the electron goes, the curvature is different. Hence, the effective mass is going to be different. This will be important because we're going to end up with different effective masses depending on which direction the electron is going. The valence bands all have their peak right at the gamma point, the high symmetry point in k-space. We tend to focus in the vicinity of the gamma point to talk about the effective mass. You notice the curvature is different for each. So concerning the valence bands, you get a smaller curvature as you go to these higher bands. The heavy hole band has the smallest curvature. The spin split off band has a very high curvature. What that means then is that the heavy hole band has the smallest value of the second derivative. Consequently, it has the highest mass because effective mass goes as one over that derivative. So small curvature means large effective mass. That's why it's called the heavy hole band. The next band has more curvature, which means a lower effective mass. That's why it's called the light hole band. The spin split off band is dropped down by a quantum mechanical effect of spin orbit coupling. So these multiple valence bands have their different effective masses, where you just remember the higher the valence band, the heavier the mass. If the light hole band had a higher effective mass than the heavy hole band, then it would be above the heavy hole band, and it would be the heavy hole band. And whatever band is second has got to be lighter. And the heavy hole band dominates the conduction of holes because the heavy hole band has more states available in it. Therefore, it will have the larger hole concentration than the light hole band. So I just wanted to convey the fact that there are multiple valence bands and there's always this splitting between a heavy hole band and a light hole band. How spin split off happens, that is how spin orbit coupling plays out, varies from material to material. It looks a lot different in silicon. But now we're not going to calculate the effective mass. That is, we're not going to take that second derivative and we're not going to do simulations for that. We have some reference data available and I'm going to talk about how to use the reference data. So you got this handout, but you can just look at it on the screen. Dealing with how to calculate effective masses from some input data that, that's available in the literature. I'm going into this in a little bit more depth than our textbook does because I really want you to understand effective mass and especially a distinction between 
two types of effective mass, one having to do with density of states and the other having to do with carrier transport. For electrons, we're going to have to consider the fact that in the crystal there is this anisotropic movement and we have two different masses. The mass when it's moving parallel to the c-axis and the mass where it's in that, that blue plane. So the effective mass of electrons, we have to remember, depends on the anisotropy of the crystal. There are two ways to average the parallel and perpendicular mass of an electron or the light hole and heavy hole mass of a hole. The first way is the density of states averaging, which we'll use whenever we need to calculate carrier concentration. They're listed in the table below here, a couple of columns for the electrons in the parallel and perpendicular direction, and a couple of columns for the light hole and heavy hole masses. How the averaging is done is different for electrons and holes. For electrons, where we have to be concerned about the isotropy, there are two perpendicular directions in that blue plane. You could think of it as x and y direction. And there's one direction parallel to the c-axis. The perpendicular direction is double weighted, with a geometric average being used to get the effective mass. The perpendicular direction is squared, and the parallel direction isn't, and then we go to the one-third for the whole thing. That's literally a geometric average. For holes, we're not concerned about the anisotropy. We're just concerned about whether or not the hole is in the light hole band or the heavy hole band, and they just happen to average together this way. So you take the heavy hole band mass to the three halves, light hole band mass to the three halves, and then add them together and take the whole thing to the two-thirds, and it's averaged. This G in the expression for the effective mass of electrons is a crystallographic piece of information, and I have it tabulated here. It's literally the number of equivalent crystallographic directions. Silicon has six. Gallium arsenide is, is isotropic, so it has only one equivalent crystallographic direction. And you'll notice that that G being one corresponds as well to the effective mass in the parallel and perpendicular directions being the same for gallium arsenide. I looked up the effective mass of the electron in the parallel and perpendicular directions and the effective mass of a hole in the heavy hole and the light hole band. And then I used these averaging schemes to fill in the density of states, effective masses of electrons and holes. For indium antimonide, I didn't have them, but I had these numbers for the density of states, effective mass. And holes have a different averaging scheme for the heavy hole and light hole masses, and I put those in the, the expression and generated this column of density of states, effective mass for holes. 1.09 is the density of states, effective mass for electrons in silicon, and 0.593 is the density of states, effective mass for holes in silicon. What these numbers mean is they're multiples of the actual mass of an electron. So if you take the actual mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and multiply it by 1.09, you have the effective mass of electrons in silicon. If you take that same mass, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, multiply it by 0.593, you have the density of states effective mass of holes in silicon. So it has the dynamics of a particle that has that mass. The other averaging scheme is the conductivity effective mass, which is used throughout Chapter 2 of our textbook because it's used for all things having to do with particle transports. Values for it can be found in Table 1-3 of our textbook. Those are conductivity effective masses that are listed there. They're also computable from the numbers that are provided in the table here for the mass of electron parallel and perpendicular or heavy hole and light hole mass. It's just they're different averaging expressions. The conductivity effective mass of an electron is still a combination of two perpendiculars and one parallel. They're combined inversely. The expression for the effective mass of holes is far more complex. Uh, I'm just going to give it to you here. And now you can use these expressions along with the numbers in these four columns of the table to generate conductivity effective mass. And that's averaging of effective masses. And anisotropy is a big deal when it comes to the motion of electrons. Because remember, the effective mass of electrons depends on their direction of motion because the curvature of the dispersion diagram depends on the direction of motion. And so we have to consider the parallel and perpendicular directions of motion of the electron. And as you remember from the table, these two values are really different, 0.92 versus 0.197 in silicon. Except for gallium arsenide, where they're the same, 
because gallium arsenide performs isotropically, that is, this little g is 1. Let's do an example. Let's find the conductivity effective mass of an electron in silicon. So we go to the table and we find values for the mass of an electron in the parallel direction and in the perpendicular direction, and we use the conductivity effective mass averaging scheme with those numbers. So I pull those numbers out of the table and just put them in this expression. It was 0.197 for the perpendicular direction and 0.92 for the parallel direction, and you get that 1 divided by the effective mass of an electron is 3.85. Invert that to actually get the effective mass of an electron, 0.26. So the conductivity effective mass of an electron in silicon is 0.26. What does that mean? That means it's 26% of the actual mass of an electron. So you multiply 9.11 times 10 minus 31 kilograms by 0.26 to get the conductivity effective mass of an electron in silicon, 2.37 times 10 to minus 31 kilograms. So that's a basic summary of effective mass of electrons and holes in more detail than is treated in our book, but I really wanted to get the distinction between conductivity effective mass and density of states effective mass in front of you. Make sure you've read the handout that I provided from Anderson's textbook, chapter 2, the first four sections, which goes into this detail that I've been presenting here today. Okay, next we're going to talk about the density of states and the Fermi function and how they're used together in order to determine the carrier concentration in a semiconductor.